we're going to get started. We may have a few more students coming in, um, but we'd like to get started with our celebration of Hispanic Heritage Month, which runs from September 15th to October 15th. And what we're going to do today is have four of our English department professors, uh, including myself, uh, read from their work. Some may be Hispanic related, some may not, but we are all <coughs> Hispanic in one way or another. Um, and so yeah, this is what we're doing to celebrate. Um, I'm going to go ahead and read a small biography of each reader that you're going to hear today. Um, and uh, I think I'll go ahead and read them in the order that they're going to be, uh, we are going to be reading. Um, and then uh, I'll give you a little information about uh, how to find uh, more of our work if you're interested. So our first reader today is going to be uh, Professor uh, Lourdes Rodriguez Florido. And uh, she has published two novels called A Whisper of Angels, which is a fantasy romance novel, and also White Trees, uh, which is a young adult novel. She started working at Broward as a full-time English professor in 2004. And here at BC, she worked um, as the South Campus Learning Communities Coordinator and has specialized in creating themed courses, including one based on ethics and another one on post-apocalyptic literature and also on gender and romance. So she will be our first reader. Our second reader will be Alexandra, Professor Alexandra Alessandri, and she is a Colombian American poet, children's author, and professor here at Broward, where she teaches composition, creative writing, and literature. Her work has appeared recently in the Acentos Ascent, Review. Review, Rio Grande Review, Yarn, and Atlanta Review. Our third reader will be Dr. Astigarraga, and he received his PhD in English from Oklahoma State University, his MFA in Creative Writing from FAU, and his BA in Literature from FSU. His fiction has been featured in the Southeast Review and Passages North. He teaches writing and literature here at BC and is at work on a novel and editing a collection of short stories. Dr. Astigarraga lives, writes, and fishes in and around Miami, Florida. Um, if you've come in, uh, you're welcome to come over to this other side. If you, there's a couple of chairs over here. Okay, and then um, I will be the last reader, and I'm the author of two poetry chapbooks. Uh, one is called Passage to America, and the other one Each Day More. Um, and I publish my poems in numerous journals and anthologies, including Alimentum, which is a food journal, Crab Orchard Review, International Literary Quarterly, Notre Dame Review, and most recently, an anthology called Two Countries, Daughters and Sons of Immigrant Parents. And I'll be reading from that today. Um, I also just published in a little zine, which is like a quick magazine or anthology that is put together. It's called The Politics of Shelter, uh, and also an FAU's Swamp Ape Review, and a new uh, food anthology from the University of Mississippi called Vinegar and Char. So today we're going to begin with Dr. Rodriguez Florido. Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm Professor, like she said, Lourdes Rodriguez Florido. Yeah, I'm going to share a little bit about my two books. Uh, the first one is White Trees, which I would describe as a young adult South Florida um, book. It takes place here in South Florida. And my other book, which is the more recent one, is uh, A Whisper of Angels. And this one is kind of hard to place in a genre, but it is a, um, like she said, it's fa it has fantasy elements. It has, it's a love story ultimately. And it takes place in the past, the present, on earth, and in a part of heaven. So it's kind of, that's the fantasy element of it. But I wanted to share, talk to you a little bit about 
what I find really interesting about uh, when I teach literature or read books is kind of like where do um, writers get their inspiration? Uh, people at, will ask a lot. When I wrote White Trees, there are some biographical elements in here. I'm Cuban-American. My family came over as refugees. And so some of the themes and some experiences that I had are in here. Not the whole thing, but it's more of a biographical type of a book. But A Whisper of Angels, people are like, where did you come up with this story? My two characters are two gay, hiddenly gay guys who live in the 19th century, right? So they live in the 1800s. So they're like, where did you get these ideas? So I'm going to share a little bit of where I got inspiration for some elements of my books. Um, but I always like to do that with writers when I teach writers. So a lot of times with writers, their biography, you know, experiences they have in their lives play into it. Um, for example, you know, and also their interests. So I'd like to, to bring up a couple writers that I teach. For example, Mary Shelley, who wrote Frankenstein. She, um, all her children but one died, you know, in infancy. And so she writes this story, right, Frankenstein, which is about <coughs> this scientist, Dr. Frankenstein, who's searching to bring life out of death. And so you can kind of see why she was interested in that theme in a personal way. Um, that's a good example. Another example is like Jane Austen. She writes like uh, very popular 18th century, 19th century love stories. And all of her major novels have like dance uh, scenes in them, ball scenes. And she loved to dance. So that's an example of how writers put their interests and their life experiences in, into their books. So I'm, I'm going to, like I said, point out a few things in my books that are kind of um, biographical or things that I have interest in. Um, so the first one, I'll start with this because it's Hispanic Heritage Month and this is really my sort of my Hispanic themed novel. But one of my chapters is called Homecoming and you know if any, any of you have come from other countries or your families have come from other countries you realize how there's always that want especially if you came you know fleeing something to go back home so I kind of grew up in a household where that was just kind of tangible, whether it was spoken or not, that, you know, we had left a country that my parents wanted to still be at. I came very young, so I, for me, it, maybe it wasn't as much, but for my parents, definitely. So I have a, a, a part in my book where the main character, Miranda, she's a, a, a teenage girl. Her grandfather has Alzheimer's, and as part of his Alzheimer's, he's always kind of living in the past, in the past in Cuba, and he's always wanting to go home. So I'm just gonna read a short part of this. It said, uh, just to set it up a little bit, in the book she goes out with the grandfather to um, on a sailboat on a day when he's better. If any of you have had family members with Alzheimer's, they have good days and they have really bad days. So she takes him out on a boat, uh, a sailboat, just you know, there in the bay or whatever with um, other family members and as Miranda sat in the back of the boat with Abuelo, she looked around. It was the type of day she wished would last forever. The boat skimmed the waves, pushed along by a strong breeze. The sun's rays skipped across waves that looked like glistening blue diamonds. Abuelo had a calm, contented look as he stared out at the waves. He chatted briefly on and off, recalling some of his fishing experiences with amazing details. Hours passed, the sandwiches and fruit were gone, and they started to head back. In the past half hour, Abuelo hadn't talked much and had now grown silent. He seemed oblivious to everything but the sea. Miranda and others had grown silent too, lulled peacefully by the beauty around them. In the distance, Miranda spotted one of the small green islands that filled these waters. Estamos llegando a Cuba, Abuelo said suddenly. So just to translate, that means we're, we're reaching Cuba. Um, Miranda looked over at her grandfather, not knowing what to say. He had said that they were finally reaching Cuba. At first it scared her. She knew he was getting lost again in his mind. <clears throat> she was about to correct him when she stopped. She suddenly realized that on this day, his dream of going home to Cuba seemed real to him. Let him believe it, she thought. Si, sí, abuelo, she answered. Estamos llegando. Okay, so that's from this book. Um, just on a personal note, which 
uh, my mother ended up getting Alzheimer's and she would often um, say, you know, be kind of back in Cuba. So not, this was after I wrote the book, but um, it was really strange how it kind of affected me even more, more personally. Um, but let me move on to Whisper of Angels, which is kind of a very, very different book and um, talk about some of my influences for this book. Um, as I said, this is a fantasy novel. So the main character, Nicholas, uh, at one point, he is an angel, basically, hence the title. And so he comes back to Earth and he ends up haunting someone. So he's kind of a fallen angel. And my inspiration for that part of my book kind of came from a song. You know how art kind of influences other art. So I don't know if you guys know the, the group or the song, but there's a song, My Immortal by Evanescence. Does anyone know that? So it has a really great video with it. Um, when I was writing this book, that song was out and it just kind of triggered this whole idea of someone haunting someone. So I have a section in my book where this takes place. Um, so I'm just going to set it up. Nicholas is haunts his best friend. There's reasons for that. You have to read the book to find out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but he ends up haunting him, and uh, I'll read just a little of that section. Um, my powers of whispering were real. I could be heard. Later that night, I followed Henry and Shelley as they took an evening stroll along the Wharf District. My heart ached as they held hands, <coughs> wishing it was my hand he touched. At one point, Henry turned to her and kissed her. Why could I not be the one who felt his lips? How I wanted to hold him, press my body against his, feel his chest and thighs against mine. That would never happen now. But no, I shook my feelings away as I had when I had been alive. It was wrong, and I was nothing but a god-awful shade. Now, a ghost. Truly, what was I now? I didn't feel angelic as I had rebelled against all of Leonardo's instructions. I looked around, suddenly wondering if Leonardo would come or send someone to retrieve me. And then what? Would I be sent away from the realm? Where could I go? Could it be to hell? Surely if there were nine heavenly realms, there would have to be at least one hell. So that's that particular scene. And then I'm, I'll, I'll just do one other one. So um, another um, inspiration, I guess, that kind of ended up in my book was a trip I took about 10 years ago to New Bedford, Massachusetts. Um, New Bedford has a real interesting whaling history and I've always been very interested in maritime history. Don't ask me why. <laughs> I haven't been in the Navy or Coast Guard or anything, although my husband was in the Coast Guard. <laughs> but, um, but I've always been very interested in the sea and uh, uh, maritime stories. So I've read a lot of great maritime stories. So my two characters end up on a whaling ship and they're from New Bedford. So I just want to read a little bit. That was the earth setting, the original earth setting for my story. And uh, I'm just going to read a little bit about of that. Um, I sat on the bench in the square across from the wharf and stared at the Ernestine. Her three rows of white sails ascending upwards like outstretched wings. I hoped her beauty and my art would help meet my rage, but I wasn't sure if it would be enough. It was dusk and everything was quieting down the merchants locking up their shops to head home while groups of mariners headed towards the nearby tavern. The Ernestine was the latest of the whalers to arrive in the harbor, having come back just a few days earlier. And like all the other ships that traveled in and out of New Bedford, Massachusetts, I wanted to add her to my collection of drawings. I wouldn't have much time to get a preliminary sketch before the shadows of the night took hold. And I didn't want to be around so long that I would have to deal with the people who populated the wharf at night. As I hastily worked on the drawing, a loud, rather slurred voice made me look up. Hey, I know him all to pieces. A rotund, mud-splattered sailor swaggered towards me, followed by another tall one. Oh, hell, not now, I thought. A couple of drunks was the last thing I needed. Nat, nat, not, not now. Stop, don't bother that boy, said the taller ones. We ain't here for the likes of him. They were probably out looking for one of the worst-side prostitutes that scurried out like roaches once darkness comes. The Mariners made New Bedford a more raucous place than someone of my quiet disposition liked, 
1857 had been a particularly loud and hectic year for our town. Dozens of ships had gone out on the hunt for the sperm oil that made New Bedford one of the richest towns in America. The oil that came from sperm whales lit lamps, lubricated machinery, and our town was filled with all the makings of the industry, from immigrant sailors and wharfside prostitutes to rich shipping agents and owners. We lit the world with our trade. Okay, so that's it. And thank you for allowing me to share a little bit of my book. Good morning. Good morning. So I am Alexandra Alessandri, and um, as uh, Elisa um, noted, I am Colombian American, and a lot of my writing um, explores identity. Um, as anyone who is, uh, just by show of hand, how many of you are hyphenated Americans? You're either immigrants or came from it. You know, parents were immigrants, grandparents were immigrants. There is a certain experience that comes in trying to bridge the two cultures and trying to grow up American, but also embracing your parents or your grandparents' home country. And so it is something that I, I explore a lot because growing up, there was a lot of, oh, I'd go to Colombia, well, you're not Colombian, you're a gringa. And then here, oh no, you're not, you're not American, you're Colombian um, or Hispanic or Latina. Um, so I do a lot of exploring of that. I also explore a lot of um, family issues. Um, I had an interesting relationship with my father and when he passed, um, a lot of that came out into words. Um, and so uh, some of the stuff that I'm going to read to you is going to fall under those two, um, those two themes. And I'll talk about the other one in a little bit. Um, <coughs> this poem came out in um, the Poetry Journal of Atlanta Review. It was a finalist in their international uh, poetry contest. It's one that I'm actually really proud of. Inheritance. The crucifix sits and fits inside my palm, cool pewter against my cracked skin. Christ, with his outstretched arms, looks on imploringly. It was my father's, given to him by his mother, a gift. I imagine her whispering, well done, mijo a priest in the family to guide us into promised lands. When I was young, Papi told stories of his seven-year-old self playing priest, offering a communion of banana slippers with El Padre, El Hijo, y El Espíritu Santo to a parish of his cousins. A calling, perhaps, and yet decades later, he would cast it aside like the sotana crumpled on sacred ground. Why'd you leave, Papi? I often asked my question settling around his wheelchair into puddles of undisturbed dust. Porque si, sí, he'd answer. The past is the past, and not worth unearthing once it's laid to rest. When he passed, I plucked the pewter crucifix from his room, barren except for the lingering scent of Winston cigarrillos. I claimed my inheritance, as if somehow, a new home would dislodge the mysteries of seminary school and perturb priesthood. But Christ remained silent, arms outstretched and cool against my cracked skin. This next one um, was published in the Rio Grande Review. <clears throat> my dad had a temper, a really bad temper. And so this is um, one, and it, my pieces tend to be autobiographical. Viejo fight. Viejo means old, like old man. You stand red-faced, fists clenched on the simmering asphalt parking lot beside our two-door metallic blue Mazda, which you bought for mommy the year before, surprising, us all, surprising all of us because you didn't believe in buying anything new. Your cousin leans against the car, trying to calm your anger, which seems to barrel through you like a hurricane bent on lifting roofs and cracking walls. Tranquilo, he says, and that's all it takes. Carajo, puta, mierda, you yell before shoving him against the car. Mommy and I huddle in front of Edgar Drugs. Mommy clutches her purse with a dread of what'll happen when we get back home. Shattered glass, broken tables, perhaps bleeding knuckles. 
I glare at you, then at gawkers who've joined us, like high schoolers chanting, fight, fight, fight. Hate sticks to me like the Miami humidity as the words viejo fight get caught in the neon. Um, I'm gonna shift a little bit um, from somewhat, from definitely autobiographical to somewhat autobiographical. And these are forthcoming in a literary magazine that's for young adults. Now I write for children, um, including young adults. And these kind of fit into that thematically for young adults. But again, a lot of my identity gets um, into that. Doing high school when you're a senorita. When you're a senorita, your dreams are cracked open like granadillas. Wet seeds spilling from parted lips, scattered, lost, folding within the limits your parents place because you're not like the others who collect sleepovers like seashells. You have a perfectly functioning bed, your parents say. Why would you want to sleep somewhere else? And I see a couple chuckles in there. <laughs> when you're a senorita, complaints are a currency reserved for the brave. You're restricted to si senor, si senora, and God forbid you speak the way your peers do. Your parents will slap the sass so fast from your mouth. Cuidado, they say, eyes ablaze. Senoritas don't complain, don't disdain. Keep it up, ya verás. When you're a senorita, boyfriends are a language your tongue doesn't recognize. Even if the boy three rows down in English class is someone you wish you could know better. Que es eso de novio, they say. Una señorita doesn't flaunt her body. She knows it'll attract sinvergüenzas. <laughs> when you're a señorita, leaving home for college is a dream that tastes like summer ripened mangoes, like guavas freshly picked from trees. But when you tell your parents this, they cross themselves, throw their hands in the air, lament where they went wrong. Don't even think about it, they say. Senoritas don't leave home before they're married. True story, my mom said that to me. <laughs> so when you're a senorita in high school, you hide makeup in book bags, hold hands in the hallway with a boy who will never meet your parents. You talk loud, laugh louder still. Sorry, laugh louder, dream even louder still. You sway your hips as you walk, shoulders squared, chin high, eyes swallowing shadows. Your parents aren't there to stop you, so you collect your dreams like spilled seeds until the moment you can scatter them free. <clears throat> so I'm actually gonna shift gears here one more time. In 2010, I started getting sick. I started developing symptoms um, joint pain, fatigue, that my doctor, primary doctor at the time, um, chalked it up to, you're just getting older. I was I just turned 30. Um, <laughs> so I was getting older. That's just it. I was not just getting older. I mean, I was getting older, but I was not just getting older. Um, shortly thereafter, I was diagnosed with a chronic illness. Um, it's a blend between lupus and rheumatoid arthritis um, and fibromyalgia. And so a lot of grieving one's health, grieving who I used to be um, and who I still wanted to be, but within my limitations, um, started making its way into my writing. Um, I wrote a verse novel that is now currently on submission, and I'm going to read an excerpt from this. Now, sorry. It is not my story. It is not a memoir. It is autobiographical. A lot of the things that the main character, Mia Diaz, goes through is um, very much what I tend to go through. Um, I did not have a seizure, she has a seizure, but there is a lot of, of me in this story. Um, really short, I'm not starting at the beginning. This, uh, it's YA, so it's a young adult novel. Um, the main character is 16-year-old Mia Diaz. She loves to surf. Um, and she loves to write poetry, though she is incredibly shy. And she, is not, she doesn't feel she's brave enough to share her words. Um, 
this is going to pick up in the moment where she is in class and she is forced to read um, a poem that she wrote for her creative writing class. And she has a seizure. Butterflies. Face flushed, I pull myself up out of the chair. The walk to the front of class takes years. Camille whispers, you've got this. But I don't. Already, nerves trickle down my spine, making the notebook in my hands shake. As I pass Noah, I catch his smile, as bright as the Miami sun. Good luck, he says. I manage to wiggle my tongue loose. Thanks. I try to focus on a spot on the wall next to the big round clock, but 26 pairs of eyes stare back at me. I try to pull on Camille's confidence, to shape it, weave it, drape it, until it cloaks me. I stare at the scribbles on the page, take a deep breath, and begin. Surfing is the closest I'll get to God. My voice shakes, sounds hollow in my ears. I try to ignore Noah watching me, Mr. Banya grading me, and the rest of the class judging me. A tingle distracts me momentarily. Firecrackers sting up my fingers, sharp hands falling asleep, feeling only they're wide awake, the tips turning white. I shake one hand, then the other, and somewhere from the back comes a giggle. Heat floods to my cheeks as the knot in my belly twists tighter. Wrong. It feels wrong. Firecrackers track up my arms and neck until they reach my head and there explode behind my eyes. Sunset orange zigzags, black and white polka dots, stars and fireflies. Too much noise, too much light, too much pain. I sway and somewhere someone gasps. The room erupts into a burst of blue-violet bubbles which start popping and suddenly there are butterflies everywhere swarming around me fluttering around my fingers, tangling inside my hair. I stumble on my feet, all sound ceases, and then I'm falling, 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 until blackness swallows me whole. Aftermath. Mia? Brain buzzing, eyes blinking, heart thumping. Should we call 911? Light blinding, headache, brain. Someone tapping. Mia, can you hear me? A fuzzy shadow of a face forces me to focus on the person in front of me, Mr. Benya. I try to speak, to say I'm fine, just dazed, dizzy, but my tongue refuses to work, and this time it has nothing to do with Noah. Noah. Memories tumble against my brain as I remember, voice trembling, words surging, butterflies fluttering. I'll call her mom. Camille's voice, a beacon slicing through the fog. No, I groan. Students whispering, clocks ticking, chairs scraping, and then from somewhere because luck has a sense of humor. Noah, help me get her to the nurse's office. Hands gripping, arms lifting, head lolling. Is she gonna be okay? Jaw twitching, tears prickling, knees buckling. I've got you. Noah's deep voice, smooth, soothing and strong, pushes past pain, confusion, humiliation, and I don't want him to ever let me go. So, um, well, thank you for coming out, whether or not you were sort of required to or not, um, that's okay. Um, you know, my name is Eduardo Astigarraga. If you wanted to roll your R's, like many of us in the crowd probably can, you would say Eduardo Astigarraga, but you don't have to say that, that's okay. Um, uh, the, I'm going to read two pieces to you today. One of them is a flash fiction piece. Flash fiction, for those of you that don't know, and it probably depends on who you ask, but it's just really short fiction. So it's usually either under a thousand words, depending upon some, or under 500 words. Really short, okay? Just a couple pages. And the whole purpose is to try to tell the story in a very short amount of time. And then the other story I'm going to read is, uh, is a little bit longer, but it's sort of the end of the story, and I'll set that up in a minute. Um, as far as themes that I have in my work that I'm sort of seeing emerge is 
I mean, family is probably the one theme that I could see that emerges in a lot of my work, whatever I'm writing, whether I'm writing the novel that I'm currently working on or, you know, the short stories for sure as well. But, um, but as far as, you know, if thematically everything is dealing with being Hispanic, sometimes I find that to be a very daunting task where if you are of a certain race or ethnicity, you're almost asked to speak for speak for all Hispanics, you're Hispanic, tell me what Hispanics think, or if you're black, you're black, tell me what black people think, and it's just like, well, I'm an individual, and I think this way. So what I'm saying is, is that uh, a director I really admire, Guillermo del Toro, he's a Mexican director, you probably know him, he was once asked by, I guess, white movie producers, what is uh, so his Mexican about your movies? And he said, me. <laughs> so the point is, is I think that, you know, sometimes you want to create characters that are exactly like you and a reflection of you. And sometimes I even write from uh, a female perspective because I want my main character to be a woman. You know, I'm interested in sort of diversity in my stories. This one in particular, though, this is just a flash fiction piece that I'm going to read. So this one is called Ingredients of a Cuban Sandwich. Okay. <laughs> Carmen Rita tells you to finish off the frijoles and lechon. The pork is charred in just the right places, crispy at the ends like the chicharrones you snack on when arriving home from Gables High, and the onions are translucent and sweet from the olive oil she uses to fry them with. She's your mother's older sister, the one who raised mommy when Papo left, three years after Abuelita died. Taste isn't the issue. Frankly, Carmen Rita's the best damn cocinera in the family. Tomato pickers surround her food truck on Monday to Saturday at 11 in the scorching afternoon, and she doesn't leave until every last one of her medianoches, Elena Ruz's, or arroz con pollos is in the small intestines of every Central American, Mexican, and Cuban farm worker Homestead, Florida has to offer. Sharing a house with Tia Carmen Rita and Mami is like living on a Spanish soap opera, <laughs> minus the ridiculously big-breasted muchachas and sweaty cocaine dealers. <laughs> You're the supporting male cast member, the only recurring character given any weight besides herself and Mami. The few boyfriends your mother does have come and in and out of the telenovela like handsome one-episode guest actors. But Tia Car Carmen Rita writes, stars, directs, and produces the show, and you're the comic relief. If you say you're not hungry, she'll tell your mother the same theory she has about every man on a diet. Elena, he refused to eat. He could be a little pato like Ricky Martin. It's not natural for a man to be that flaquito hips like a puta from the street. <laughs> if you finish every last bite of her salty pork, creamy frijoles, and sweet plantains, she'll tell your mother what she always says when she watches you eat. Elena, él se come todo. I was surprised Gordito didn't eat the plate too. <laughs> it's a win-win situation either way. Gordito is what she calls you a common nickname in most politically incorrect Cuban households for the fattest inhabitant. You've always hated it, even taken to eating galleticas in your room, hoping to avoid her disapproving stares as you shovel the snacks into your mouth like a starved Labrador. You tell her you're done eating, and she asks if you want one of her tampons, which she says like this, tampon. <laughs> You stare at Carmen Rita. I didn't know that Mari Machas bled from the boy, you say. She smacks you across the head with her frying pan, leaving a lime-sized welt under the shag of your hair. Neither of you tells mommy about it. Years later, at your mother's funeral, you'll hold Carmen Rita in your arms as she flings herself on you. She'll grip you tightly while telling you 
how much mommy meant to her, to her only sister. You'll see that the roots are silver and start to feel sorry for her. Then she'll look up into your face. She'll run your, her hands down your arms and then your middle and tell you how much weight you've gained. <laughs> so that was one little flash fiction piece that I was going to read you. Uh, the next piece I was going to read you is from uh, kind of my current collection. It's, uh, it's called Hound Dog. Uh, this one is more about loyalty, I would say. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm just going to read the last, th the last third of the story. The last third of the story, I would say, is a little bit more... Um, well, I wanted you to get a kind of a sense of closure, and there's a lot more dialogue than there is in the beginning, so I liked that about it. <laughs> um, but anyways, I'll set it up very briefly, and then I'll get into it. So Frankie is my main character, and he's recently divorced. He's uh, six foot seven, a former basketball player, and uh, he, his friend, one day Stephen, comes to visit him. So Frankie works on a boat, and he proposes to, Stephen proposes to Frankie that he help him basically defend the honor of his wife. Because his wife was at a bar, and this guy took uh, his wife's watch as well as grabbed her chest, okay? Well, that's what Stephen tells Frankie happened. Uh, the truth is, is that Stephen and Emily, his wife, are now divorced, and Stephen was just trying to steal his dog back from his wife, who is currently engaged to the owner of that bar. <laughs> and Frankie doesn't know this. Now, Stephen is the kind of friend, maybe you all have him, I know I had him in high school, who he just doesn't quite know how to be a friend. He's the kind of person who, he's not, he's not really loyal. Um, he tries to buy people off, but he doesn't understand how to really establish a true lasting relationship. And even though he means well, he wants he wants to have that friendship. Well, Frankie thinks that, you know, Stephen's the only one who needs to sort of consider how he can be friends towards other people. But in reality, Frankie's not a great friend either. It's kind of like that story by Flannery O'Connor, you know, a good man is hard to find. If you haven't read it, you should, it's great. I think it's really applicable to a lot of things today. And the last line of the story is, or one of the last lines is, she could have been a good woman if there was somebody there to shoot her every day of her life. That's the, that's the last line. And uh, you should read it if you get a chance, because it's great. So in any event, it's about how people can sort of be judge, judge, judgmental of other people and you know, not take a look at their own, them themselves in the mirror. So basically, Ted, Emily's new you know, betrothed, is now um, offering Frankie a job because he's a big guy. And Stephen has stalked off because they didn't call the, call the police. They were trying to be kind to Stephen. So now Frankie and Emily, Stephen's ex-wife, are sitting down to talk. And just so you know, Frankie and Emily had a thing in high school. They used to hook up. But, um, well, let's just say that Frankie believes that Stephen doesn't know this. All right? All right, so I'll start there. This is Ted speaking, the owner of the bar. <coughs> You're not gonna regret it, son. That big boy you set on his ass when you got back Lulu for us? He's been here six years and I've got him up to 1850 an hour. You play your cards right, the cards that I'm giving you, and you'll be taken care of, said Ted. I don't see how you're just going to pay this asshole. Not after he helped Steven take Lulu, Emily said. I'm sorry about that. But like I told you, I was just here for the money Steven promised me. And he didn't tell me anything about stealing your dog. He told me you, we, were, we were coming up to rough up a regular, a guy who grabbed your, your what, whatever, it doesn't matter now. My what, she asked. It's not important. I was never going to rough up anybody. I'm not going to jail for him, I said. Emily, as you shouldn't, my friend. Life's about making smart choices that lead to better opportunities. You don't need someone like him holding you back. Ted's attention seemed to be on something behind me near the bar. Please excuse me, friend, babe, Ted said, nodding to Emily. He got up and left us at the table with Ted Jr., the beer guzzler, and his two gossiping daughters. I turned around and saw that Ted seemed to be instructing a patchy fit, a bearded bartender onto how, um, sorry, onto how to properly pour from the tap. 
When I shifted back around, Emily was staring right at me. I raised my beer up towards her and down half my glass. So, Ted seems like a decent fellow, I said. Emily just continued to stare at me. Listen, Em, I know you think what I did was shitty, but Stephen brought that upon himself. He's not exactly the poster boy for loyalty. That's funny coming from you, she said. I placed my beer back down on that silk co coaster. What do you mean by that? What I mean is that loyalty is your problem, not his. Stephen's problem is that he thinks he, need to buy, he needs to buy what's already free, what doesn't cost a damn thing. Love, forgiveness, saying I'm sorry. No, Stephen's approach is to buy you a damn necklace or labradoodle or chocolates in place of developing any sort of real relationship. I blame his father, really. The bastard gave him everything he didn't need and none of what he did. I'm not disloyal, Em. I'm just trying to be the best I can. And loyalty, I said, raising my glass and downing the rest of my beer. Hell, loyalty doesn't pay my rent. Loyalty doesn't pay alimony. Frankie's also recently divorced, by the way, <laughs> and kind of still hung up on Emily. If that's the price of loyalty, then hell, loyalty can kiss my ass. Is that why your wife left you? I swallowed hard and felt like I had a cue ball stuck in my throat. What'd you say to me? You heard me, she said. That's real nice coming from you. How long you been with Ted? Was the ink even dry in your papers before you started reaching into Grandpa's Depends for a rub and tug? Emily smiled. She seemed calm and perfectly at ease with the conversation in a way that I was not. What is it with men and hearing the truth, huh? Tell a guy what he doesn't want to hear about himself and he resorts to the first grade again. Honestly, you're pathetic. And Ted might be older than Stephen and you and even me, but at least he's a grown man. Frank, not so pathetic that we didn't fuck around for a bit in high school. Does old Ted even know about us? You ever mention me? My point exactly. And no, Frankie, because I never even think about you. I didn't want to stay there eating Emily's shit, but I couldn't exactly leave when the only job offer I currently had was from her geriatric boyfriend. Behind us, there was a duet going over by the karaoke machine. Oh, it's a karaoke bar there, and it's a honky tonk in Davie, I should say that. You know one of those country bars? Okay. <laughs> A middle-aged man and woman with the same bowl haircut were singing Time of My Life at the top of their lungs while looking into each other's eyes. They might have been adorable if they weren't so amazingly synchronized in their dance movements, as if they fucked to dirty dancing every night of the week. <laughs> For your information, my wife didn't leave me. We mutually agreed it was over. That time wasn't right for us. There are times when you say things aloud, hoping to convince people with your seriousness. Times when you can almost convince yourself, even just for the moment. This wasn't one of them. Emmy was, Emily was looking in the direction of the karaoke stage, not making eye contact with me. Listen, whatever you, about, you heard about me and my wife or her friends or whoever, it's not true. I never stepped out on Sarah. I'm not a bad guy. Emily turns, turned towards me. You're not a good one either. You sit there with a smug look on your face like the world owes you something. Well, loyalty is more than just keeping it in your pants, genius. I don't know exactly what happened between you and Sarah, but trust me, I've known a lot of men in my life and I bet you have, I said. <laughs> I knew I sounded like a little boy on the playground having a temper tantrum. Seeing her again made me remember how much I used to want to impress her. Not that I loved her or anything, just that Emily was the kind of woman and once the kind of girl that you wanted, needed to be noticed by. She had an invisible power, like a grappling hook on my brain that activated my cerebral need to please. I had never been sure how to impress her, but I'd always wanted to, and I was resorting to schoolyard hair pulling to get her to pay attention to me. Emily looked at me now with the apathy given to crying prisoners in a jail the kind of look prison guards give that says, no matter how much you don't want to be here, you are, so fucking get over it. <laughs> Her eyes looked into mine and she continued. There are two kinds of men, Frankie. The kind who listen and the kind who don't. Guess which one you are. This was the longest Emily had ever looked into my eyes. 
I was sure of that. Even in the times when we had had sex, when we were teenagers, I couldn't recall ever getting a glance so long. Emily wasn't the kind of woman you just looked at. She looked at you, and I wanted this moment to simultaneously end and continue forever. I'm convinced that I might have been given a few seconds more if her attention didn't turn to the man singing behind us. Off in the karaoke corner, Stephen, who's by the way been thrown out of the bar, was crooning Elvis's hound dog with the confidence and showmanship of the best of impersonators. His hip gyrating and foot shimmies displayed a quickness of foot that I hadn't seen, not once, not even when we were just kids and our biggest worry was whether we'd take down our crosstown rival and be kings for just one more day. His voice crooned and it was angry and beautiful and sad and hopeful all at once. And I was embarrassed and proud at the same time. Well, they said you was high class. That was just a lie. Yeah, they said you was high class. That was just a lie. Well, you ain't never caught a rabbit and you ain't no friend of mine, Stephen said. One hand had been on the mic and the other was messing with his hair. At the end of the stanza, he pointed towards our table and I couldn't tell if he was pointing at Emily or me. Two of the security guards were rushing towards the stage and they were flanking Ted like Dobermans on leashes. Maybe Emily's speech got to me or thinking about Sarah or even how I dicked over Steven, or maybe the alcohol and his uncharacteristically talented crooning, but I ran at the stage like a rhino on a stampede. My thigh knocked over a table, drenching a couple with the pitcher they'd been nursing in front of the karaoke stage. I headed off Ted and his stooges, acting like a great wall of Big Frank in front of a singing Steven. Ted gave me a look of disgust, the first time I'd seen his calm demeanor with even a glimmer of annoyance. The bouncer I'd knocked to the ground earlier tried to get past me, but I held him with one arm. Apparently he wasn't looking for a fight yet because he kept trying to push my arm off and get around me. The other bouncer, a short but stocky redhead built like a machine gun on human growth hormone, made his move to get around me onto the stage. He was heading towards Steven who was bracing himself for the inevitable impact. The bouncer was within a couple feet of Steven when I horse collared him from behind, using his black t-shirt, ripping him back into the ground. The guy was strong and dense, but to a guy like me, he felt like a moderately successful day charter fishing, like an ice chest of four mahi and a dozen red snappers. Steven had temporarily stopped singing, but when he saw what I did, a sort of deranged grin spread across his lips, like the effects of an adrenaline shot to the heart had just taken over. He started singing again, kept singing, even after Ted got the DJ to cut the music and there was nothing but the silence of the speakers and the hooting and hollering of the crowd barking and begging us on as the two bouncers tussled with me and as Ted, his children, Ted Jr., Cindy, and Shelley, all slapped at Stephen, who held the microphone to his lips as though the thing were his last cup of water, screaming into the device even though the plug had been pulled on the electronics. You ain't never caught a rabbit, he screamed over and over again as his mouth were a scratched record eternally stuck on the same part of the chorus. You ain't never caught a rabbit, he sang. As I was unsuccessfully avoiding rib and face shots from the two bouncers, after one of the bartenders had joined in taking me down to the floor, I caught a glimpse of Emily. I saw her through a space in my arms which I was using to protect my head from the three men's attacks. I must have looked like a jumbo shrimp, covered in light beer on a sawdust floor, curled in the fetal position. Emily was puffing on a freshly lit cigarette with the kind of ease that contradicted our current predicament. She was easy to pick out in the crowd because she hadn't left her seat, and with all the movement and flashes of blurry people around me, she was nearly still, her only movements coming from the graceful pulls off her cigarette as though time were in fast forward and she were in slow motion. By the time the cops arrived and, p and put Stephen and I in separate squad cars, we were bruised and bloodied, but I was relieved to see them. A guy can only take so many kicks to his head, torso, and face before things to start to get a little woozy, even a guy my size. The holding cell they placed us in was a mixture of public intoxicators 
pimply, misdemeaning 18-year-olds, flashers, peeping toms, drunk drivers, petty thieves, and brawlers. Steven sat in the corner with his face in his hands, and I was on the bench diagonal to him with my back against the wall. If our appearances gave anyone pause, they didn't show, because almost all of the men were keeping to themselves, sleeping or trying to, or staring off into an existence and choices outside of these bars. Steven's face had scratches that ran from his eyelids to across his mouth and cheeks. The blood on his face was dry, and he had a fat bottom lip the color of a plum. As far as I could tell, my face made out with just a cut near my earlobe, but my head, ribs, and legs felt like the running of the bulls had taken place over my body. An old man with long, stringy gray hair down to his mid-back on the opposite side of the jail cell was standing and whispering to himself incoherently gibberish that sounded like Latin, except for the one word I could catch that made any sort of sense. You, a word he repeated every couple of sentences, a liturgy only he understood. I didn't know you could sing, I whispered to Stephen. He didn't look up to me, just shrugged his shoulders and continued to rest his hands in his face like an ostrich head buried in the sand. Look, man, I'm trying here. You set me up. Use me. And I did the same to you. Used you? I was going to pay you, he said. Stephen was sitting up now and his hands were clenching the bench on both sides of him. Well, you weren't exactly honest about your wife's situation, and I wasn't exactly honestly going to help you, not only the way you wanted. Yeah, well, that's a dick thing to do, he said. In my memory, this was the most aggressive I'd ever heard Stephen be to someone he considered a friend. He was always so desperate to make people like him that he usually just bought them shit and took any ribbing from teammates or coaches because I think he didn't want to come across as offensive. Not if that meant losing people from the circle he was trying to buy. Yes, it was, but we're both in the can. We've bled together, man. I told myself I wasn't throwing down for no one, and look, here we are. The truth was, I wasn't even mad at Steven. Sure, I was jobless and in jail. And later, my PD would get the charges down to drunk and disorderly because ten Ted wound up being so cooperative. Fucking Ted, with his too agreeable personality. No, I felt like everything in my life had leading up to this moment, one sad moment in a jail cell with a man I hardly knew and never really did, and not Sarah or Emily or Stephen were to blame. The highlight of my entire career had been a two-year marriage, a junior college basketball career, and that one time I almost reeled in a world record cobia when I was 16. My father told me to keep the line tight, and I did, until the copper-colored monster was in 10 feet of the boat, and I gave her slack because, well, I just got tired and thought I'd given her enough of a run. The cobia took this as an advantage and headed back out into the depths of the big blue, and I reeled in an empty fishing hook. A once-in-a-lifetime fish, gone. My father looked at the empty line, the gaff in his hand, and said, Damn it, that's why you keep the line tight, boy. Too much slack, they're liable to take your bait. This is a just the last little bit right here. Um, you ever think that no matter how hard you try, it just still might not be enough, said Stephen. I could tell by the slurring of his words that Stephen was still a little drunk, but maybe not as drunk as I would have hoped considering the tire on his mouth was impacting his speech. Of course, Stephen. Where in the hell did you ever get the idea that you, if you tried hard enough, it would all work out? I wasn't in the mood for a pity party. Stephen shook his head. It's just, when Coach used to tell us dig deep and want it more than the next guy, I guess I always kind of bought into that being true, at least hope for it. That if I gave enough, it would be enough. That's just shit you believe when you're 18, when you have a hard-on for days, and the main objective of every day is to get your dick wet because you're going pro one day and starting a business that will make you millions. And life is full of possibilities, I said. Stephen looked at me, and his chest started to convulse. He looked like he was going to vomit. He put his head in his hands, and I could hear the low wheezing breath of what sounded like a restrained sob, and I felt like shit, even if I did believe every word I told him. You know, um, you really can sing. I can't believe I didn't know that about you. The gray-haired man was against the bars, calling out his incantations toward the pot-bellied correctional officer staring at our cell. The officer's chair was directly in front of the holding area. Steven's rapid wheeze had slowed into heavy breathing, like a sprinter regaining his breath after a race. And Emily, well, 
when you started singing, I, I saw her. It, uh, she lit up. She must have liked your singing. Stephen massaged deep circles into his face. And when he looked up, his eyes were bloodshot but dry. Really? You think she liked it? I wasn't trying to hurt her with my song choice. I hope she doesn't think that. I was just upset. Ted, that old bastard, he just makes me crazy. Yeah, he's a real piece of work, I said. When do you think we're going to get out of here? He asked. Hell if I know, friend. Yeah, well, when we find out what our bail is, don't worry. He sat up and leaned back against the wall. I got you. It's done. I looked at him and saw the same 16-year-old kid who'd been my teammate what felt like a lifetime ago. I'm surprised he didn't know I could sing, Frankie. I was in all the school musicals. I invited some of the guys from the team a couple times. Coach showed up once. I was Tevya in Fiddler on the Roof. It was kind of a big deal. Emily saw me a bunch. It was back when, it was back when you two were still on and off. I didn't know that Stephen knew about Emily and me or why he'd never said anything. I heard some hollering and laughing going on in our cell. When I looked up, the gray-haired man was grinding against the bars in his underwear with the agility of a yoga master and the provocation of a go-go dancer. His clothes in a neatly folded pile by his feet. The drunks, pervs, thieves, and other miscreants were all laughing as the correctional officer yelled for us to shut the fuck up. The man kept dancing as if no one could hear him, periodically licking the bars of the cell and spewing his gibberish as the correctional officer banged his club near the man's face. But the old man continued unflinching. Last part. What a fucking loser, a drunk towards the end of the cell yelled. But the gray-haired man wasn't deterred and he kept gyrating. I glanced down and cut my hands, my knuckles bruised and red from scraping on the wooden floor of the bar. I thought of my ex-wife, Sarah, and wondered if her new guy was treating her any better than I did, and sort of hoping that he was and wasn't. I thought of Emily slowly taking drags off her cigarette and staring at a future she wouldn't find too surprising. And I thought of Stephen, of the remaining money he owed me, money that I needed and wanted to ask for, but didn't. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. Wow, I want to read that whole story. <laughs> Let's give all our writers a hand of applause. finish up with uh, just a few poems and um, and then I don't know if we'll have time for questions but we will be hanging around uh, and you're welcome to ask us any questions and also I wanted to let you know that uh, if you're interested in seeing more of our work or some of our books um, there are links on all our BC social media um, so you can find us there I'm going to uh, begin with a poem uh, that was published uh, in an anthology that is uh, very apropos to Hispanic Heritage Month. It's called Two Countries, U.S. Daughters and Sons of Immigrant Parents. And I have a couple of poems in here, but I'm just going to read one. Um, this one is called Exile. She knows she can never return. The hole in the heart muscle releases a long plaintive note but the mind, like water seeking its level, rushes in to fill the rent, to soften and mute strings attached to the protected childhood. Green plantains frying at noon, slow fans overhead urging Caribbean breezes through the many windows of home. Gone, lost, even their shadows, except in the stomach and on skin, they too have memory have learned to take in alien nourishment, reconfigure weather patterns. In the new country, each move to a new house, each first night in a strange hotel, repeats the exile sine qua non. Adapt and settle quickly. Fill drawers, arrange toiletries, place pictures, flood the streets the feet will know, and swim. The palm fronds overhead are clapping, and the strokes, they too, will become familiar. So um, I write a lot about um, 
images, images I see, I hear, I read about, and that's what inspires me. And I also have similar themes of home and family. And uh, this next poem is a more recent poem because that poem was about being in exile, not being, you know, being away from home. But um, I actually, uh, I'm Cuban, Cuban-American, and I got to return to Cuba about a year and a half ago. And this is the first poem I finally wrote um, based on that experience. I had written a little bit, but, um, uh, but this one is sort of the first real one that's coming out. And it has a little epigraph uh, by Thomas Wolfe. Some of you may have heard uh, his saying or the name of his book that says, you can't go home again. And it turns out that he got that line from a conversation that he was having with another writer uh, who asked him, uh, don't you know you can't go home again? You know, that you can really never go home. So this one right now is just called Home. They say you can't go home again, but if you try, you'll need a taxi driver like Rafael Martin Martin, who was lounging behind Casa de las Americas smoking a cigarette when he saw me pacing the sidewalk, determined not to use a legal but rude taxi driver from the stand at the Hotel Presidente next to my Casa Particular apartment in El Vedado in Havana and offered to drive me to my first home in Miramar. They say you can't go home again, but if you try, you'll need Rafael willing to drive around in circles for nearly an hour up and down Calle Ocho entre Septima y Quinta Avenidas and finally to park in front of the garish three-story building garish green three-story building, get out with you, walk to the front door to verify the address, cross the busy street for a better picture, stare up from the sidewalk, and help you imagine the wide balconies without thick black railing enclosing the air inside. Is that where your nanny stood with your year-old self in her arms, wailing to your mother below that the authorities had sealed the house shut, barred her from entering her own home after my father had just fled the country to avoid imprisonment? Is this where my mother stood on this sidewalk, looking up at one child, another sleeping inside, her husband flying to the U.S., her plans to follow him uncertain? They say you can't go home again. You won't even knock on the door. No one will come to the window. Your mother will stare at the pictures you took with Rafael. She'll study them 55 years after she locked the door to her first married apartment for the last time and say, no, that's not it. I don't recognize it. You can't go home. You can return to the country of your birth for the first time since you left as a baby. Go there when your mother who carried you out is not keen, to say the least, on your returning on you seeing the island you once lived on but have never known, the island that scattered her family for the rest of their lives and buried them on three different continents. You'll return to the look on her face, the do whatever you want but I don't like it and will not say another word about it face, that one, for which all were practice. And you were right, Mommy. Cuba is beautiful, vibrant, sad. You can't. Nothing there. You and Poppy made the home. You were the home. And uh, read a little short poem. Um, don't want to read that one. Yeah, it's called Never Finished. Um, and I was listening to um, a story on NPR where I get a lot of uh, inspiration because they're so imagistic in their stories. Um, this woman who invented a gene editing technology, some of you may have heard of, called CRISPR. So she was talking about this. And there's also the writing process in here, so some of you will be able to relate to this. It's a short little poem. It's called Never Finished. We're always editing, revising, proofreading, fixing ourselves, making adjustments and plans, using scrubs and juicers, Start over, begin anew, a second act, a 
It's Monday, the new year, your birthday. Convert, let's renew our vows. Have a garage sale, sell it all and go on the road. Cash out, take it from a scientist. DNA repair happens all the time or we wouldn't exist. We're wired that way. And let's see, I'll finish. It's gonna have to be short. Okay, it's not so short, but I'll finish with um, another, uh, with a food poem. We've heard food, you can't be Hispanic without food. You know, food, um, and you'll hear some of the same things in here, but I also just wanted to finish on this lighter note. Uh, this is called Tortilla Española. Are any of you familiar with Tortilla Española? It's like the Spanish om uh, omelet. So, Tortilla Española. My grandmother made it, my mother. My childless, my childless aunt made the best one. Her evenly diced potatoes, olive oil fried to luscious softness. The edge of salt, semi-setness of egg, dissolved essence of one barely minced onion teased our palates when we smelled the thick omelet Spaniards make daily cooking. As kids, we knew it was coming when mounds of potatoes, brown skins darkened by rinsing, appeared on the kitchen table. When women sat, peeling pounds with small paring knives, dropping each one into a bowl of water to keep it from graying. Then came the flamenco stomp of heels on wood, chop and dice, chop and dice, the heat of frying and browning, of sizzling, turning out the tender mass potato, the tender potato mass into a metal colander in the sink, a bowl beneath to catch oil not absorbed, and again into a separate bowl of half a dozen scrambled eggs, folding the potatoes into the frothy egg, pouring it all into a heavy, heated and oiled pan, patting it even and flat. In minutes came the acrobatic lifting and quick flipping the wrist bending pan onto a large plate, sliding the still egg wet on top, now on the bottom tortilla, back in to cook the other side, to set, brown slightly without burning. If you smell egg burning, it's too late. You've ruined it. Though everyone will assure you it's fine, it's not. And if it hadn't been for wars and depressions, exiles and exits that made waste a taboo, our mothers and aunts would have ditched a burned tortilla. You'll burn several before you learn by smell exactly when to toss it onto a clean plate. Done, ready to slice. Famous chefs on TV, rather than risk disaster flipping and sliding a slick tortilla back into a pan, will place it in a hot oven to finish setting. That's wrong. Know the bravery of Spaniards, centuries of famine and practice. My mothers and aunts, even I, don't lose a morsel of potato or rarely burn an arm or wrist. We flip it out, fat golden eggy cake of an omelet, sturdy, confident and warm, slice, serve or steal it in wedges until it disappears in much less time than it took to create. Thank you very much. Questions? We'll be here for a couple minutes and we're happy to answer your questions. Oh, thank you. Thank you.